Hi, I'm Jennifer Potter, Executive Director of Be Well Texas. Too many people are struggling alone these days and alcohol and drug deaths are increasing. We started Be Well Texas to offer high quality, science-based addiction treatment and recovery services anywhere, virtually or in person. In many cases, there is no cost for treatment or medications if you don't have insurance, really. Welcome to Be Well Texas. We're glad you're here. Visit BeWellTexas.org. What's up, Road Runner fans? Welcome to episode 262 of the Alamo Audible podcast. This is your host, Jared Kamas, joined as always by my co-host, Adrian Bermudez. We come to you as part of the Dave Campbell Texas Football Republic of Football Podcast Network. And Adrian, it feels so good to finally be recapping a really nice win for the Road Runners. Definitely the biggest of the year. Some have said the biggest of program history. Feels like a stretch, but it's a really big one. Really big one. I would say the biggest win in the past two years. I think I feel comfortable saying that. Well, it's an unbelievable win, Jared. Just uh, the, the resolve the grittiness uh, for them to come together after what's really just been a tumultuous m mistakes week in and week out. And finally, and they put it together in, in a quite a dominant way, 44 to 36 final score, not really indicative of what UTSA was actually able to put together. They're leading yeah, by they 20 points up, yep. up until three. They, yes, sir. We spanked them. They, 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 we were leading the Tigers by 20 points up until complete garbage minutes three minutes left in the fourth quarter when they score on a couple of chance possessions after an offside kick but you know bro i i, I was just incredibly impressed with what the road runners were able to do as far as um sort of checking themselves mid-game because we started off extremely sloppy mm -hmm. you had seven penalties in the first half something that's been a huge issue for these road runners and then in the second half they have zero uh, get it real, real tight, and again have that dominance and and really get, create the separation against the Tigers that uh, I don't think anyone saw coming at all. Um, but we respect them. We whooped them. I mean, they were just incredible, incredible on offense, incredible on defense. Great game. Yeah, you just set up so many great talking points for us to to hit on throughout the episode. I loved it. But l let's let's look a big picture, man. Like UTSA, even after the horrible loss to Tulsa. Now finds himself in a position where they got they got to win two out of three to go bowling, right? So they beat Memphis, which was I don't know. I mean, for my money, maybe the most talented team left on the schedule, maybe not the best team, but the most talented. Um, so now you got to take two out of three from North Texas, Temple, and Army, and it feels pretty doable. It's not going to be easy, but if UTSA plays in line with how they played against Memphis. Bowl eligibility is still in the cards, which didn't really feel very feasible at this time last week. So it's it's it was a huge win for you to say. You saw the best of what these road runners are capable of doing, right? You mm -hmm. think you saw them in mm -hmm. full stride in all three phases of the game for the first time in 2024, and unexpectedly, right? You, you definitely didn't think it was going to happen against Memphis. You, yeah. you weren't even sure if you were going to see it after the way that we had performed through eight games this season. And yeah, then we thought we, thought we saw sudden, the first half against Tulsa. It's like, okay, this is the team that we thought we were going to see this year. And then they had the second half collapse. But, you know, even though UTSA had some struggles in the, in the first half and very, very late in the second, I mean, I thought that was a pretty, pretty consistent performance. You know, maybe uh, the struggles in the first half, I've kind of memory hold a little bit because they won the game. But, you know, I thought all three phases showed up pretty well. Just didn't have everything go their way consistently. Like they had some bad breaks, you know. Uh, they really they didn't get any calls from the ref, man. The, re <laughs> the refs did not do them any favors, and mm -hmm. they still, you know, toughed out and came out ahead. So, just just the consistency of the performance was was very very impressive. Incredible display of growth and maturity from this team. We weren't sure if they were going to be able to put it together with sort of resolve and some grit. And uh, mm -hmm. they did just that, and and we saw we saw a team that that's been forced to grow, and I think maybe we thought was going to grow up a little bit quicker, but they they have been growing up before us. Now, can they put it together, Jared? Can they put it together? And continue yep. going yep. forward is, is is a big big question. But a lot of great things to take away from UTSA. Still, a lot of issues too. 
I need to get that's a, a great segue Adrian to one of the text messages that we got from a listener after the game uh hopefully you guys memorize the number by now you know if we continue to get messages at the rate that we've gotten I think you guys will have it memorized I'll stop blurting it every single episode but 210-660-8259 you can reach us at any time to leave a voicemail or text message um so this one's kind of long I'm going to speed through it a little bit all caps super excited about the win I came into this game expecting them to lose. This win did confirm that we have a lot of talent on the team. If they play smart and keep the penalties down, wins are completely within reach. But yet, I'm still not too confident. Even though I am a little bit more confident, I'm still not confident they can continue playing good for the rest of the season. Yes, it's a great win, but I need to see more consistency in the team until I can have belief that they can win. My faith in the team will probably be restored if we come out with a win over North Texas. And uh, Adrian, I feel like that's the the perfect dose of reality, right? It would be really easy, and I, I've fallen into this too, to dive full into the optimism and, and drink the Kool Aid and say, "Hey, the corner has been turned. They can beat every team left on the schedule. They're going to win out. You know, it's not just bowl eligibility. Like we're going to get a good bowl. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, sure. But just like we were saying before the Tulsa game." Right. If it, if a team has shown you repeatedly who they are this late in the season, you have to believe them. Right. So I hope that this really was truly the turning point for UTSA. But what we've seen throughout the first, what, 10 weeks of the season, you can't forget how bad the penalties were, the mental mistakes were, and then how bad the injuries have gotten now, you know, in these last couple of weeks. So Whoa. I caution everyone to have a little bit of restraint um, because Memphis had their fair share of penalties, mistakes, miscues as well yeah. that UTSA benefited from. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of things went right for UTSA, Jared, but we saw a lot of those issues that you talk about. We saw those issues happen in this game. This is the first quarter we had committed five penalties and the writing was on the wall. A couple of them were egregious uh, from single digit guys. And, then, uh, sitting at halftime, you, you've got seven penalties. You're kind of going neck and neck. We've seen a little bit of tightening up, but you weren't really convinced that we had really cleaned it all, uh, at all. I have no idea what was said in that locker room, Jared. I wish it could be a fly on the wall, but UTSA came out and played a completely clean second half with zero penalties committed. It was the cleanest football they've played in 2024 in that second half. And it was shocking. <laughs> I, I I did not expect it at all. But there was something that happened, I think, in the first half of this second half of this game. If they can play that clean, absolutely. The, is it, I think the sky's the limit for what, what Jeff Trailer is calling a November to re remember. Mm -hmm. right? November to remember is what, is what he wants to do here. And, uh, hey, I, I would agree with you. I think Memphis does prevent the biggest talent that UTSA has seen so far this year. They made a lot of mistakes. 12 penalties for the Memphis Tigers. They kept their penalties sort of consistent throughout the game. Uh, UTSA had two tremendous fourth down stops back to back going into the second half, uh, or going into halftime, I mean. And then they had three fourth down stops altogether throughout the game. We had two uh, turnovers on Memphis. And there was a very critical injury that happened for the Tigers. Jared. Mm -hmm in the end zone on a celebration, right? That I think... Yeah, Memphis lost three of their top five receivers <sighs> to injury in that game. And, yeah. you know, Blankemsey is the guy that you're referring to. He's the guy that did the Ronaldo celebration and, Demir, you know, Demir Demir and, you know and, like, and, look and bad. Jared, that, I'm going to assume the worst on that one. It, yikes. At, um, at, UTC at, had at, no at answer point, for him. At that point, Blankemsey had 142 yards. Uh, it yeah, was like the second quarter, right? Two touchdowns and 142 yards in the second quarter whenever that happens. You talk about absolutely had no answer for him. You're totally right, Jared. And th that injury completely shifted things for UTSA. You'd be crazy to to uh, think that it didn't. Uh, but the defense is all of a sudden able to start to get those stops after that happens. Mm -hmm. no yeah, and I think Memphis getting stuffed on that first fourth and one attempt. Okay, like UTSA, you know, played man football and just won the battle in the trenches. 
then Memphis runs it again. That was bold. That was a really bold of them. If I was a Memphis fan, I'd been steaming after that one. Uh, so it was a pretty, pretty bad play call. And you know, I think there are a few of those you probably point to if you're a Memphis fan. But hey, you know, UTSA took advantage of it, right? Uh, just like you were saying at the beginning, like, uh, yeah, I mean, UTSA won by was that eight points? But yeah, that fourth quarter didn't feel like it. I mean, it's really just like in the last minute and a half that you know Memphis had two insane ca- touchdown catches that were completely improbable had really good defense on both of them one of them was nearly intercepted and then they get an onside kick recovery as well I mean it made the game look closer than it was so I think even though Memphis probably didn't play that great and they made their fair share of mistakes you still got to give UTSA full credit for how they played because they should have won pretty convincingly they took advantage of it you're right because up until a minute and 47 seconds remaining in the game, Memphis did not score from the time that Blankham C got injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, so UTSA uh, puts it all together. Uh, offensively, in the first half, we see probably the best the offense has looked. Uh, then in the second half, we probably see the best that UTSA's defense has looked. Yep. But it really all starts with the offense. It really all starts with the man – and soon becoming the legend, Jared, we're seeing right before our eyes, Owen McCown. Wow, unbelievable performance from him as a quarterback. I would say his most impressive so far as a roadrunner. Maybe not on the stat sheet. He has had way bigger games on the stat sheet, but as far as him being the the quarterback, the captain of this team, playing smart, playing together, and just the most beautiful passes I think I maybe have ever seen from Roadrunners quarterback. I mean, the guy is just a natural talent at passing the ball. He was really a dream to watch. He was really a dream to watch in this game, Jared. Um, Owen McCown, 280 yards, four touchdowns, another game with zero interceptions, zero mistakes. And uh, to an even higher degree, he was tight. He was clean. His decision-making, he was seeing blindside rushes. He was scrambling with the ball. He was getting the ball out whenever he needed to. He placed it perfectly in guys' hands, whether they caught it or not. And we can talk about drop passes, but oh, McGowan was <laughs> flawless, man. He was flawless. And it's it's just a beauty to watch him at quarterback. Unbelievable. Jeff Trailer uh, really, really praises him on the sideline after the game or, or at midfield after the game in, in a really emotional interview for for Jeff Trailer. And, uh, and he said it and – Talking about Owen McCown, he said he's not going anywhere. I'm gonna have him for three more years, and uh, and it's got, and it just makes you really excited as a Roadrunners fan um, because he's he's really really incredible, incredible at the position, Jared. And I think uh, as the years go by, it's just gonna get as the games go by, the weeks go by, it's just gonna get better and better. I mean, that's a recruiting strategy now. You, you find the best quarterback you can, whose dad's a millionaire, and you don't have to worry as much about throwing a ton of nil money at him to get him to stick around and. <laughs> you know, you can even do the NFL argument of like, well, we're, you know, we're going to have a little lower salary on you so we can get you some, some linemen and some receivers, bud. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, jokes aside, man, it, it's so cool to see, like, the, the two things that we've really criticized Owen for this year are the connection on the deep passes. Totally clean those up. I mean, it just mm. looks so cerebral, the way that he stepped in the pocket, loaded up, got a good platform, led the receiver. Just beautiful, beautiful football. Um the first touchdown throw he had a Chris Carpenter, or it wasn't it wasn't a touchdown. I think they they got him, you know, right right before the goal line. Uh, probably his best pass as a road runner. But the second one that he threw mm-hmm. to Chris that actually got broken up, I thought was an even better throw. I mean, that one is on the money. You know, put it over Chris's shoulders, you know, streaking towards the end zone of the post route. Just really beautiful stuff. I think the defender got away with the pi there, but just yeah, just awesome. The second thing that we criticize him for, though, is like just being a little bit too slow with the decisions. And it's not like a full second or two seconds, but just those split seconds, those nanoseconds of, you know, uh, how quickly do I throw the ball to the check down to give them an opportunity to cut a field and get some yardage? Or do I throw the ball quick, throw the ball away quickly enough to prevent a sack? You know, stuff like that. Saw a huge improvement there against Memphis, and which is ironic because Memphis probably has some of the best team speed on defense of any team that. UTSA scene um, in several weeks. I wouldn't say all season because, you know, Texas State was really good and they played Texas. But uh, past that, I mean, that that defense had a lot of talent on it, um, especially in the secondary, a lot of speed. So really great stuff from Owen. I think he's like eighth in the country in passing touchdowns right now. 
Mm. I mean, it's unreal. I th- I think that Memphis game was <laughs> one of the best single game quarterback performances from a non Frank Harris quarterback in program history. Yes, yes, best he's looked as a quarterback by far in his career. Yeah, I mean, just tight, man. Really, really clean. It was the Owen McCown show first off and foremost, and I, and I really think what will probably be remembered, Jared, is his coming out party. This game against Memphis. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I can see that. He was fantastic. Oh, he was fantastic. Can I talk about the whole like ranked ranked victory thing? We didn't even talk I, about it leading in. I because, agree. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Oof. I I consider the AP poll as like the ranking up until this week when the college football playoff ranking comes out. Then that's like the only one that really matters. Memphis was ranked twenty fifth in the coaches poll, so technically. It's UTSA's first ever ranked win. I can see both sides of the argument. I'm not personally considering it the first ranked win. I may say that, but deep down, I think you got to beat an AP team or, or a CFP ranked team to get that. Um, but nonetheless, it's still something that Frank Harris was never able to accomplish at UTSA, right? Never beat a ranked team. Not even a team that was ranked in the coaches' poll. So, you know, it's still an achievement. Adrian, I know that we talk, you feel the same way as me, maybe even more strongly than I do, but I feel like it's worth talking about. Two crazy angles there, Jared. Are you telling me that's another um, monumental, never been done prior by UTSA quarterback accomplishment achievement by Owen McCown, first in UTSA's first ever bowl victory, and then Mm -hmm. now in UTSA's first ever quote unquote rank victory and oh my god i was gonna have a couple more years to get the ap one as well look yeah i could do it this year uh, i mean our army is almost certainly still gonna be ranked when we play army i agree with you a hundred percent jared ap is king college football playoff is king uh look it doesn't matter whatever you're talking to people on the street whenever people are watching the game on their television the bottom line on the scoreboard on ESPN2 does not say pound sign or hashtag <laughs> two five Memphis. No, it doesn't say that. It just says yeah. Memphis. It does not say number 25 Memphis. That's not what it says on the ESPN scoreboard. It's not what it says. You cannot call it that. And I think I agree. You can hear the argument either way because, uh, you know, coaches poll matters, right? But at the end of the day, it, it's the the number has to be by the by the school. It has to be there. That's like undisputed, mm-hmm. I think. And it's not the case in in this one. Maybe against Army, it gets done. But I, and if you want to argue that it is, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not gonna challenge yeah, you. Yeah, it's not, it's not a big deal. Like I don't want to spill too much uh, <laughs> verbal ink on this either. But I will say the fact that no one was talking about it leading to the game means that it didn't have that mental pressure on the team. Mm. They're like, oh, mm. we're playing a ranked opponent. we got to show up. Uh, so that's another reason why I feel like we shouldn't really count it. Uh, but hopefully it's not a long wait <clears throat> for the first uh, legit CFP, AP uh, rank victory. But uh, <clears throat> so, sorry, to go back uh, to it. Well, yeah, to go back to it, look, I, we got to talk about Owen McGowan's distribution to what is Yeah, man, Vince that's what I was going to say, too. Christened. What has been christened on the ESPN2 broadcast, Jared, as tied in you. Wow. Dan Dishman, Houston Thomas, Patrick Overmeyer. What a day from the three tied ends. Uh, in, in ushering in a new era after Oscar Cardenas announced out for the season, out for his career, in fact, as a roadrunner. The three guys now stepping up a whole stable of tight ends that just looked fantastic. Shrieking downfield, getting open, catching the ball on on incredibly crucial four touchdowns. Oh, McGowan's four touchdowns, all two tight ends. Unbelievable day, Jared. Uh, three tight ends. Overmeyer, I'm Thomas, sorry. Dishman, all got one. What I said, I say what I say. I said three. Um, Dan Dishman, Houston Thomas. So Dan Dishman, three rece- uh, three receptions, 55 yards, touchdown. Houston Thomas, six receptions, 44 yards, two touchdowns. Patrick Obermeyer, two receptions, 16 yards, one touchdown. Incredible day. Yeah, all of them accounts, four touchdowns to the tight ends, three tight ends, Jared. Magnificent. Just magnificent stuff. Yeah, two two things I really like about that performance from the tight ends is like, A, this is the first game without Oscar, right? O- Oscar's career is like officially over, at least at UTSA. Uh, he had a knee injury, I think, on his celebration. 
Fitting he ends mm-hmm. his career with a touchdown catch, you know. Um, mm. But I love that <clears throat> the first game without him, the baton is passed to the young guys. We talked about this quite a bit on our, our instant reaction episode that we did right after the Memphis win. Uh, that was really cool to see. I, I'm sure Oscar was really proud. You know, it feels like he's, you know, trained these guys up well. I'm sure he's like a de facto coach at this point. But I also Absolutely. really love the variety of ways that the Titans were used, right? Mm-hmm. We saw some plays where, um, you know, they would send Houston Thomas downfield in the seam route as a vertical threat. Uh, we saw them run, like, rub routes where, like, a receiver was, you know, running a screen to get the tight end open on, on the underneath route. Uh, we saw, of course, the tight ends used as blockers, both inline and as H-backs. Uh, we saw them, you know, design plays, check downs. I mean, the tight ends were all over the field being used in a, a numerous different approach, number of approaches. Um, and I feel like that's going to be really tough for defense as a game plan uh, because through the first couple weeks of the season, you see the tight end out there. Well, there are, there's only two routes they're going to run, right? They're going to run a little yeah. pro route or they're going to run an out route. <clears throat> and there's really nothing else. So the way that they're um, – you know, increasing the usage of those players, I think, gets this offense back to being creative, get, gets it back to being unpredictable. And I thought Justin Burke did an oh. awesome job scheming these guys open. Yeah, yeah, really fantastic stuff. Really fantastic stuff for the tight ends. Uh, we've also got to talk about the the wide receivers that were involved, especially in particular Chris Carpenter, who I think maybe had his most impressive game as a road runner, mm-hmm. despite maybe a drop on a, on a deep pass from Owen Cowan. That he should have come down with. You, you, you've got to look at the four catches for 108 yards. And he did catch a deep ball on a 60 yarder from Owen, uh, but he also had a magnificent day on special teams and, and, and actually a, a punt return yardage swing. And I, I don't have the exact yeah. numbers, but there had to be a re kick on an early special teams uh, punt from Memphis. And, and Chris Carpenter on the re kick actually has a beautiful return and did that a couple of times. Great day from him. Um, yeah, he had uh, two two returns for forty four yards. That's that's nothing to scoff at. That's like two no. two whole explosive plays on offense that you get essentially like for free from special teams. Yeah, magnificent stuff, magnificent stuff. Yeah, gave us a fantastic uh, field position from Chris Carpenter. Yep. Yeah, I mean it, it wasn't it wasn't perfect for Chris, but you know, Coach Shirley made a really good point in his um, in his uh, media roundtable on Monday. Carpenter was not brought in to be the primary target receiver. You know, he's just the guy they've got that's healthy, right? Uh, so they're using man. him. As, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So they're they're using him in positions that he typically has not been, and he's not a natural fit for, right? So like, on one hand, I, I you know want to talk down that you know he only had a fifty percent catch rate because he was targeted eight times and only had four catches. Two of them hit him in the hands, right? And they probably <laughs> get you know checked as a pass breakup, but. You know, Josh Stephens would have caught him. J.T. Clark would have caught him. You know, sure. Uh, but that, yeah, that's yeah. unfair to him, right? I mean, he didn't come into this season expecting to be the X receiver that's going to be the primary target on every deep shot. You know, right? Chris Carver's um, a specialist but, more so than anything, right? And right, um, yeah, you, right, got, you right. gotta, you gotta, yeah, yeah, and and you've got to, but you've got to admire what what he's been able to do in that role. That's that's he's been that's mm-hmm. sort of been forced into or or found himself in with with Owen. Yeah, that uh, first long catch he had, I mean, they. I, I love that ESPN2 broadcast. You just get so many camera angles that you don't typically get on an ESPN Plus game. Uh, there yeah. was like a, an end zone angle where you can see him run the stop and go, and it, you can just really see how fast he is, man. Uh, it was really cool to see that angle. And, you know, like I said, those Memphis, those Memphis uh, secondary players were really fast, and Chris just totally toasted them. So, you know, with the offensive line looking better in pass protection and Owen feeling really comfortable in the pocket, keep sending them. He's going to drop a few, but keep sending them. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you're limited in options too, Jared, if you're the UTSA Roadrunners offense, because the running back group is just not been able to get it done at the level that we sort of expected Mm-mm. them to in the no, preseason. It, you know, Adrian, it, it's been it's been catastrophic. Like let, let's let's call a spade a spade. It's not <laughs> all the running backs. It's not all the offensive line. It's not all the tight ends. I'm gonna I'll throw the tight ends in there. The run game as a whole has just been a failure this year. Um, with it being the bye week, I spent some time diving into the advanced stats and it was gruesome. I mean, it, it was, mm-hmm. uh, it was ha- Halloween level scariness, right? Uh, yeah. boring Barnes out of running backs that have 60 or more carries this year is last in yards after contact. He's last and missed tackles forced. The rest of the position mm-hmm. is, is not doing much to, to boost that either because the running back group as a whole 
is like way, 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 you know, to the bottom left uh, on a graph that a uh, friend of the show, Parker, had tweeted that showed, uh, you know, Ashton Genty, Genty for Boise is like top right as far as like creating missed tackles, getting yards after contact, all that stuff, like all the things you typically measure a running back on, like their ability to make something out of nothing, to turn a good mm-hmm. play into a big play. The whole unit has underperformed. Um, the strategy coming into the season was was a failure. Uh, they have all these guys in the running back room, and you know, half of them aren't playing. You got no depth at other positions. The guys that you brought in haven't been able to make an impact or haven't had the chance to make an impact, maybe. like I, I'd like to see Bryson Donnell play more. He's looked good when he's been in. But um, sure. that's been really disappointing to see. You know, Kavorian is, has been through a lot physically, for sure. A lot of carries, surgeries. Robert Henry broke his thumb in pregame warmups. I mean, it's just, just yep. the kind of look UTSA's had this year, but Unreal. you know, it's been it's been tough, man. It's it's hard, but I I got to commend UTSA for not completely abandoning the run, but also like realizing like they're pretty much an air raid team now, and they've got the quarterback that can do it. At least for the rest of this season, you've got to understand that's that's your fate, right? Is to air that thing out, and you do have the quarterback that can do it, and. Yeah. You know, it's it's your best chance is to air it out and put some points on the board and 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 run the thing up and have that fast offense. And you know, there was a there was a point, Jared, where this ball game was tied up, and you know, UTSA had the ball for maybe five minutes to UTS uh, to to Memphis's fifteen, right? I mean, and 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 they were just scoring fast and and, and unbelievably quick. Uh, mm-hmm. No huddle drives downfield and, and and big plays, deep plays for the first time all season. We saw that from this offense, which was a great thing to see. How one of them, an incredible trick play, pass from David mm-hmm. Amador, former quarterback in high school. And uh, his first game this year that we've seen him uh, had a hamstring injury in the preseason. And we actually never saw him see the field until very, very, very late just now, Jared. Um but wow, he, I mean, he threw a pretty pass, and, and then he caught, and then he caught a, he caught a pass later in that game as well. Yeah, you know, I'm glad that the double pass worked. I still don't like those play calls, man. It's just, oh, grinds my gears. There's They're no feeling themselves it. a little bit, and we've seen yeah. this before from UTSA's offense, just sort of feeling time. themselves a little bit yeah. whenever they start scoring some points. I guess it's just Jeff Trailer's style, uh, but it kind of backfired him against Tulsa. It worked against mm-hmm. Memphis. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting thing, though. It's just like something like he just like can't stay away from. You yeah, have to it, it's funny too that that's like Amador has not yeah. been available all season, and then literally like the first game back, they're like, "All right, we've, we've been waiting <laughs> on this one, baby. Here it comes." So thirty yeah. yards. <laughs> oh, <shot>. Man, <laughs> um, but I mean, on that madness, point in particular, oh, Owen, Owen Owen almost had a really really bad mistake. I mean, that's the second game in a row he's thrown a backwards pass that was off target. And uh, sure. David made a great play. I mean, he, he's not a very tall guy, but he can jump. He went up and got that ball that was thrown over his head and backwards. That could have been really bad. Um, I, I think it was Dan Dishman, maybe Houston Thomas, that had the kickout block. They did a really, really good job getting that because David was not open on that play. Like, that one, that could have gotten blown up in two different ways. So shout out to whichever tight end it was that got there. David threw a great ball, man. You see how he mm. – I, mm. I think they were runner-up when he was the quarterback in North Shore a couple of years ago. Uh, but you yeah, can see where indeed. you know he stepped in a quarterback and they won some games with him. So you he know. got underneath that thing, dude. You know that ball that that ball sailed through the air real nice. You know it, it wasn't humming, um, but it, it got there. <laughs> it was in the it right wasn't spot. Humming, but it got up there. It got <laughs> no. up for sure. Yeah, but, you know if, if, if Owen throws on target to him to start the play, you know maybe maybe David puts a little mustard on it. You know who who knows. Jeff Trailer in his postgame presser does mention David Amador only being at about quote seventy five to eighty percent. You could tell. You could tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he I was not so. as fast as as we're used to seeing from him. Um, that that hamstring injury really did a number on him, man. It's crazy that he's been out for this long and he's still not one hundred percent. But you know, you, you get to knock the rust off a little bit against Memphis. You got a bye week this week, um, so hopefully yes. we start to see you know him to get back to his usual speed against North Texas because this, this wide receiver unit definitely needs some bodies, man. They need some guys that know how to get open, that can catch the football. And Amador has already shown that he can do that in his, in his freshman year. Um, he'll be able to redshirt still since he was out for so long. So that's another plus. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, takes a big step forward against North Texas next week. Well, and Jared, maybe the, the trick play is like uh, 
Jeff Trailer's secret way of getting just some confidence and some juice going with David Amador. Like, hey, you know, hamstrings still bother him a little bit. He's only at 75% right now. Let's just get him out there and just chuck a deep pass downfield and just, yeah. you know, get that confidence back a little bit. Yeah, you can tell that they I, – I don't know if I would say that they planned in the preseason for him to be a big focal point of the offense or if it's like just this past week because there were the injuries, but – uh, they had a lot of different ways to get him involved against Memphis. Uh, he lined up as an mm. H-back on a play. Like, that was actually, yeah. um, I think, the first touchdown pass to a tight end. Amador was lined up as the H-back, and then he kind of came on, like, a drag route across the field, and, like, the defense just completely sucked in to cover him. And that's what got um, the tight end so open on that. You know, he threw a pass. They had him running underneath routes. So, um, that was good to see. Uh, you know, and we know they're going to use him on the jet sweeps once he's healthy. So... Um, I think he'll he'll bring some, you know, dynamism. I always struggle to pronounce that word. I don't know if it's right or not. <laughs> I think he did he'll, that. He'll bring, okay. uh, yeah, he'll bring some sure. fireworks That's to the offense when he's healthy. Great stuff. Great stuff. Jared, uh, yeah, I think offense pretty much covered everything on the offense. Any, anything else? Yeah, yeah. Offense, offense sources sorts of settles out, uh, mellows out in the second half, and the defense takes over uh, with just a really impressive performance. I think collectively. Like, it wasn't any one single person just being unbelievably stand out. Um, you know, you could say Jamal Legon, who was uh, the – well, no, it was Martavius French, I think, maybe. Well, I think you could maybe say kind I thought of stood French out. He got, the, uh, yeah. he got the AAC Player of the Week mm -hmm. um, award, and it was UTSA's first of the year, if I believe correctly. Uh, in we any used to department. rack those things up, bro. Like, we used to rack those week. things up last two seasons, <laughs> three seasons. So – yeah, incredible game from Artavius French, but I think just collectively as a unit, you know, everyone kind of stepped up and, and tightened up really on defense, and and, mm -hmm. and they looked fantastic. Yeah, I thought French was awesome. Ten tackles, two tackles for loss. Uh, Ligon's still playing with a huge club on his hand, but, you know, I thought he had a solid game despite that. Uh, and there was one play, Lig they had Ligon at outside linebacker to rush the passer, and he had Seth Hennigan dead to rights, man, what was going to rock his world. Uh, but he couldn't like really bring Seth down because Hennigan's a pretty big guy. I mean, he was he was a skinny mm -hmm. little freshman the first time UTC played him, but he's put the pounds on. Um, so you know, Ligon couldn't quite bring him down. You know, I know for sure if he had you know five functional fingers not wrapped up in a club that he would have had the sack there. So I thought he had a good game as well. Uh, but the the way the secondary stepped up in in a very very tough situation was super encouraging, right? You had uh, Ken Robinson out for the year, right? Who's you know the heartbeat of the secondary. Uh, Zay Frazier was out. Uh, Denver Harris was out too, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So you got a lot of guys that got forced into, you know, starting against one of the best passing offenses in, in the country, really, in the Memphis Tigers. Um, one of the best quarterbacks in this league. Um, also, Cyrus Dumas had an awesome game. Mm -hmm. He gave up a couple, mm -hmm. but I thought he played very, very, very well. Uh, Jamarius Lewis had the huge interception that, I kind of go back and forth on if it was a play of the game or not, because UTSA didn't really do anything with that turnover. But I think mentally it really got to Memphis. I think that was the moment where they're like, oh, we might lose this game. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, yeah. And then, and then Ty Milton, too. I mean, he only he didn't play a lot of snaps. When he came in, Memphis went right at him, targeted him. He nearly had two interceptions. He had two really, really great plays, um, just great technique, good ball skills, good leaping ability. And it just shows, dude, the talent has been there all along. These guys get the opportunity. They go in preparing to be the starter, and they've got the talent to make it work. But look, yeah, I, th I think it was a fantastic collective unit um, play from, from the defense. But you brought up a couple of moments there, particularly not scoring after the interception uh, for, for UTSA. There's two turnovers that UTSA comes away with zero points after. Uh, there is seven penalties in the first half, five in the first quarter, two really egregious ones from a usual suspect, a recurring, recurring, what is it, offender, recurring offender mm -hmm. in uh, in Donnie Taylor, single digit guy, mm -hmm. and this is these these sorts of issues are the things that are sort of still showing, despite how good UTSA played. That coupled with the running game as well, there's there's some glaring issues that need to be fixed and addressed still. And they've, they've got to clean that up if they're going to have that November to remember that they anticipate having. Um, Jared, you know, when, when you look at, like, collectively, 
UTSA's um, biggest issues there that are sort of listed. What what do you think they've got to hone in on? What do you think they think cannot they can... afford to get wrong, you know, to, to have the November that they need to have to get bowl eligible? I think they can win with the running game they have. I mean, I, I think Owen's been good enough that he can mm-hmm. carry the offense and score enough points uh, that they can win in spite of not having that run game. Obviously, it makes things a lot harder for sure. I, I still think the primary reason UTC lost the Tulsa game is because they, they couldn't run the ball in the second half. But if the penalties go back to where they were, you know, double digits every week for a month or two months straight, I don't think they can overcome that. They especially can't beat Army if they're committing penalties because you know Army's not going to commit penalties to balance it out. I mean, like we're, we're sitting here celebrating a seven penalty performance against Memphis, but for most teams, that's maybe your worst showing of the year when it comes to penalties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And it's one of UTSA's best. It's their best against an actual opponent of caliber, right? But for the most part, it's it's really, really been sloppy. And the only reason it can be celebrated is just because in the second half they committed zero. Uh, but, the, but the first half was really, really ugly with penalties. And every single little UTSA talking group that I'm a part of that was watching that game, you know, I mean, that was that was the biggest harping point, the biggest complaining point, bitching point from – for my friends and myself during that first half was what is going on with the same penalties week after week. Yeah. Yeah, The Um, the Donye situation was pretty upsetting to me. I mean, the first one, it's like, all right, that's Donye. You know, he's going to make those plays. And then his second penalty was the exact same penalty that he had in the fourth quarter against Tulsa that extended their drive, gave them 15 yards. And I don't know if Tulsa comes back and wins without that penalty to see him make that same penalty twice. And then he gets benched for like two or three plays. He comes in at the end of that drive. Like, like you are not sending a message to the team that that's unacceptable. So I'm not going to yeah. hammer on the coaching staff too much because the penalties did get cleaned up in that second half. But, you know, if they, if they continue to be a problem again, moving forward, you know, against North Texas and beyond, I you you just, you got to bench guy. You got to bench repeat offenders, especially at a position like Donye's where you've got a mm. really, really good talent mm. behind him at Owen Peewee that's probably not seeing enough snaps. So I don't know. That left a really bad taste in my mouth. And a lot of people and, texted me about that. Like, I cannot believe that Donnie's back in. I'm like, yeah, me either. And how about just the statement? You know, how about the statement of, of what your culture is supposed to represent? A single digit guy making those penalties. He's the one that's supposed to have the example, right? So I don't know. You you, you got to really think about the, the the sort of standard you're setting on the sideline when you're letting guys just get away from would have been extremely costly penalties in the, the entire momentum of UTSA's play. And and you could argue a lot of these penalties and a lot of these mistakes have been the sole reason why UTSA has lost their games that they have lost. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's egregious. Something's got to get done about it if they're going to win the games that they need to win to get bowl eligible. That's two of three, as Jared was saying earlier. Um Back to the defense, uh, number one in sacks in the American Athletic Conference, Jared. Uh, UTSA has really just been menacing in the backfield. And I think there was a stat that they showed, gosh, is it um, 19, mm-hmm. 19 straight games with a takeaway and a sack? Unbelievable from, from yeah, the UTSA awesome defense. And what I really love about that first stat, about UTSA leading the American in sacks, is like, Jamori is probably the sack leader, but he's probably nowhere near the top of the leaderboard for, you know, individual sacks per player. I mean, maybe top five mm-hmm. if he's lucky. I'm sure there's plenty of guys out there that have six, seven, eight or whatever. It's like the team effort as far as the pass rush goes that I think makes this defense so effective. Um, even if Jamori was finishing more of his quarterback hits and actually getting the sacks, uh, you know, the offense can plan around that, right? They can have the running back chip him put the tight end over there, double team him, you know, shift the play, roll out or whatever. But when it's like the whole defense that's getting after the quarterback, you can't really game plan around it. All you can do is just not have the quarterback sit in the pocket for that long. Um, So that level of uncertainty that it creates in a quarterback's head of like, I don't know where the pressure is going to come from, um, I think is is huge. I think especially for some of the younger quarterbacks that, you know, UTSA may see, um, I think that's a tough thing to – to combat yeah the the, you know it it just also goes to show i think aside from the penalties which have which have mostly been coming from utsa's defense uh, how an 
unbelievably strong and talented group they are a uh, year in a year out really at that but just gosh they're the, they're dominant they're the, they're mm-hmm. dominant and and they really shut down Memphis and and again Blankenbach had that injury but UTSA wasn't able to stop Memphis on what their first three four drives uh, of the day um and so they being able to buckle down like that just so she just goes to show and, and the consistency that this of, defense always has. Yeah. A lot it's, of it's youth there. up there too, right? Um, John Jones isn't a young guy because he's a transfer, but he's he's a newcomer and he's had a huge impact um, down the stretch here. The new Nick Booker Brown, if I may say so myself, Jamie mm. Buxton, right? Vic Shaw is coming along. You've seen Cameron Cooper out there get some pressure on the quarterback. So that's really encouraging to see, right? I don't know if any of those guys are a sure thing that they're going to be some you know, absolute shutdown pass rusher. Uh, but they've all shown an ability to pressure the quarterback. Um, Vic's got a couple of sacks, I think. Uh, they're forcing throwaways and stuff like that. So, you know, just they're making life difficult on quarterbacks. And the secondary needs the help. So it's great to see. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Jeff Trailer did mention he was happy with the younger, the newer secondary players as far as being foundationally correct, quote unquote, in their right spots. They got beat, but it wasn't due to mental error. Uh, maybe just a little the slow. The only one I can think there, of but... is Elijah Newell got beat really bad on a corner route mm-hmm. on one of one of the yeah. touchdown throws. Yeah. Outside of that, it was, yeah. I mean, it was it was pretty clean from a mental standpoint. Just some really talented receivers on Memphis's side, and they made some great sure. catches. Great quarterback. The second one that Newell gave up, I've got no problem with that. I mean, that was like an improvised play from two all conference players, right? And you've got a true freshman out there, man. I I got no problem with that one. I you know, no problem at all. It, it was very encouraging to see, I think a clean performance from that secondary as far as being in the right spot at the right time. Jared the sort of just zoomed out perspective of this game, uh it's it's absolutely critical. I think it's most evident in Jeff Trailer's emotional press conference. And I don't know if you caught it, but in the post game presser, not the not the one that was in midfield on ESPN two, but in UTSA's media post game presser, at the very very end of it, he even gets a congratulations coach from UTSA president Taylor Amy. Uh, and I don't know. I think it just uh, also just goes to show that um, it's very 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 important win. This UTSA program, uh, huge, huge. It's absolutely huge. Uh, but it was audible. It was loud. And even Coach Trailer responded. He was like, thanks. Thanks, for, <laughs> President Amy. Yeah. yeah it was, uh, I, I think President Amy moment. does that after every game. I don't know if the mic always picks it up, uh, but I, I've, I've noticed it several times because I, I always think it's kind of goofy, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was um, funny, like because you never hear it on the uh, uh, on the interview. Yeah. So, like, if, if if you don't hear Pre- uh, President Navy saying that, most people don't. It was like, oh wow. And uh, <laughs> but I think it was an important win. I think it was an important moment. But I think Trailer's emotion in that post game and in that on on that uh, middle of the field interview on ESPN two. Yeah, even him, he wasn't really sure. I think himself if this team was really going to tighten up and get it together the way that they did in that second half. Uh, but he was also impressed mm-hmm. with them, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've got yeah. it. They've, they've really, really got it, Jaron. I think this is a huge momentum capture going into a bye week. We came out of the first bye week not looking good, but I think it'll it'll be different this time around. Man, I just – I honestly feel – because I was debating with a friend of like, is this a good time to have a bye week or not? Because UTSA did not look good coming out of their last bye week. And you've got some momentum now. You would want to, you know, keep that going. But I just think with the injury situation, the extra week, you know, get get Amador healthy a little bit. Uh, William McCoy will be back, you know, non-injury related uh, with his absence. And congratulations to him and his family on the birth of his first child. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you're probably going to get, I, w- I would assume Zay Frazier will be back. He should be out of concussion protocol. That's, I think, that's what his injury was. Denver Harris, maybe, with, with a toe injury, could be back, right? You're not going to get Ken Robinson back, but I think there's a few, a few other guys you may pick up as well. And I think that's more important than any momentum or anything like that. Oh. Andrew, we can't wrap this up without talking about Tate Sandell, my guy. The golden chocolate strikes again. He does strike again, man. Another fantastic day for my boy, Tate Sandell. A three for five on the field goals. His long a UTSA program record. 
54 yards straight through the upright. Had another attempt from 61, which on his first try, he got iced, but he did hit the crossbar. Uh, I think he probably expanded all of his leg power into that kick because <laughs> yeah. he was well short and well off to the to the left, I think, on a hook left yeah. on yeah. his second attempt, his subsequent attempt. But still an incredible day. Um, he's He's money. When it comes to the field goals that you need to make, uh, he's automatic. It almost makes you uh, wish that Trailer would would have gone to him a little bit more frequently during some some game moments earlier in the season. Uh, but Sandoz got say, it. I, I, th- I, I love that kid too. Like his personality cracks me up, man. Like he he's such like a Friday Night Light fo- TV show character. It, it amazes <laughs> me, man. Like he, he's like a mini trailer with his euphemisms and the way he talks, you know, you can tell he's really intelligent, but funny as well. I'm a, I'm a big Sandell fan. Incredible man. We, and it continues the great legacy of place kickers here at UTSA. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tate Sandell, you know, Jared, he's, he's very, very talented. Uh, a guy maybe that UTSA needs to protect in the off season. Do interest yeah, needs to be, it would, would it be the first time we've lost a really, really good young kicker to the portal. And I owe interest might need to be, allocated to the golden yeah, chunk maybe. of the golden sandal sandal yeah dude I'd i, I think so. he may he may be on scholarship already i could be wrong about that i think he might be though okay so that helps because a lot of a lot of schools won't use a scholarship on a player right, right so even if right. you know like, like let's say an sec school is going to throw 20k at a kicker you know if you get a full scholarship at a g5 school you, you, you may still come out ahead there like if you don't need the cash in your pocket that urgently but yeah we'll see um also i don't know if we mentioned it jamal ligan became the program's leading tackler in this game that's right fantastic mm-hmm. to see well deserved several records being broken for for these 2024 roadrunners here against yep. memphis yep who would have thought um, i imagine it's a program record for most uh touchdown catches from tight ends in a single game oh that's a good one jared has to be four four yeah. on the day a hundred percent of oma counts Four touchdowns, all the tight ends. Beautiful stuff, man. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. Well, cool. Any, any last thoughts on Memphis that we didn't cover? Uh, no, I just got to say I'm uh, really, really surprised. Really yeah. surprised. Happily, pleasantly surprised I, with this team's resolve. I, I thought they were going to keep it close. Like, I, I thought that Vegas line was actually, like, pretty pretty good. I think I picked Memphis to win by 10 or something like that. Uh, but I, I'm surprised that they had toughed it out, right? Because, like, I know how easily Memphis can come back in a game. So they had just done it against Charlie the week before. Uh, so to see them hold on and, and play aggressive to protect the lead, right? They didn't just turtle up on offense. Um, I thought the coaching staff did a great job of handling that and making adjustments and all that stuff. So I'm, it is I'm, I'm really relieved. It is ultimately one of Jeff Trailer's more impressive wins when you consider the circumstances in his time yeah. here at UTSA. And yeah. really, really great stuff. So got to be sustained it's got to be sustained of course we won't be talking unt today we've got a bye week so mm-hmm. we'll be previewing the mean green next week and uh, Dude, stay what tuned a, for uh that. what a difference for utsa to be sitting at home getting healthy north texas is playing army the best <sighs> army team of our generation probably and yep. uh, bad things happen yep. when you play army right even if you come out with a win they're gonna they're gonna beat you to hell right that that injury report for North Texas is probably going to be pretty rough next week. Um, so it may not be the best time of the year for UTC to have a bye, but it sure beats playing Army. Vegas only has Army as a five-and-a-half-point favorite, uh, as yeah. they do have to come into Denton, but I think it is going to be a very tough game for the Mean Green to play in. Uh, there is a situation here, Jared, where – North Texas could be one game over 500 while UTSA is one game under 500. Uh, we could have uh, our season's fate decided in a game against the Mean Green at home on ESPN2 on a Friday night at 7 o'clock to get to 500 in conference, 500 overall, um, and only need one more win to get bowl eligible. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's huge stakes against the Mean Green coming next week. Holy cow. I, 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 gosh, I don't know how many people are convinced to go to see UTSA football in person after that win against Memphis. But I, I'm hoping that Alamo Dome can have a good crowd on Friday night for UNT, man. It's a rivalry. Yeah, I game. think so. It's a rivalry. I, game. I, I, I hope you see the student section. 
Yeah, I hope to see the student section prove. You always know you're going to get a good game between these two, no matter how the season has gone. So um, I'm, I'm excited for that one. I'll be there. Uh, what, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, man. I completely blanked out. Okay. As you guys said, we, we recorded this one pretty late in the week for a preview. And uh, I think we did a good job remembering the game. Because I, like, I talked to you before we recorded. I was like, I don't, I don't remember a whole lot. I think I might have forgot the game. Well, 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 we, have a really, we have a really, really fresh reaction to yep. the game in the immediate aftermath. Uh, Jared and I went on YouTube live for the very first time in Alamo Audible history to give an instant game reaction probably 45 minutes after the final whistle. Um, and, and that's relatively in depth. And so, yeah, if you, if you want to hear our, our fresh thoughts, you can catch that. Uh, we always do post-game reactions, day after reactions on our Patreon for our Patreon subscribers. If you are subscribed to our Patreon, that is some of the bonus content that you get here at Alamo Audible. You always get a day after reaction episode for your UTSA football games. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, speaking of Patreon, uh, our Patreon subscribers were treated to an early release of our basketball preview episode. Uh, so that came out for them last week and for everyone else on Monday ahead of UTSA season opener against Trinity. Um, a, a game that was Austin Conch's debut, as well as the debut of a whole new roster. And uh, they pulled it out, man. It wasn't pretty. Trinity outshot UTSA pretty pretty handily. But UTSA let their athleticism win the day, right? They really clamped down on defense, um, you know, back half, the second half. Generated a lot of offense off of turnovers, used their length to disrupt passing lanes. And uh, I would say you can see the vision with this roster. So... Uh, they play again on Thursday, I think against North Dakota. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing more from from Clanch and his guys. And congrats to all them on on winning their first game. Incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. Yeah, we we saw the very very beginning of UTSA's basketball in the new era under Austin Clanch, Jared. Yeah, um, more athletic for sure. A lot longer. We'll see if they're able to to gel an offense and and keep up the defensive intensity. Mm -hmm. all right guys right. well before we sign out for the day do want to say thank you to all of our subscribers on patreon including our board of trustees members digi t john otwell gary and ruben represent the utsa burger gang tailgate ray redding and meet me apparel brandon grail and the grail realty group and the elizada proficient benefit solutions ian mcclendon and secret llc javon townsend president of the dfw chapter of the utsa alumni association ryan squares water and construction utsa annual giving artisan vapor and cbd wayne gonzalez and the runners rising project and as well as our big money donors, Ben Tovar, The Bunch Family, Zach Esperiqueta and the San Antonio Podcast Network, Alejandro Benavides, Dan Nerdhall, host of Around the Birdbath, who has a key premier guest on Around the Birdbath this week. So stay tuned Ooh. for that. It is being edited right now. Uh, yes. Shout out to Jacob Cavazos, board president of the UTSA Alumni Association, John Nally, Rick Cortez of the Rowdy Road Grillers, Sumner McDaniel, UTSA King Bowser, Maddie and Home Field Apparel, where you can use home, UTSA Wants Home Field to get 15% off your first order, which makes for a great gift with the holidays around the corner. So thank you guys all so much. It was a lot of fun recapping a really, really big win for UTSA against these Memphis Tigers. Uh, it was great to see the collapse of the Memphis fan base on Twitter. You know, could not happen <laughs> to better people. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be back very soon to have a similar reaction with a win over North Texas. I uh, hope you guys... Enjoy this episode and uh, follow us on social media if you're not. We'll see you guys back next week.